Um, <laughs> all right, uh, Lord, we are so grateful for our sister Tracy. Lord, thank you um, just for all the time, effort, um, mental um, capacity that she has put into this. Lord, we just ask that you would use her this morning for the good of your kingdom. Father, would you um, fill our souls with who you are and the richness of your word. Um, please do just um, give Tracy your peace, your calm, um, and yeah, just your protection this morning as she brings the word to us. Thanks so much for this time. In your name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. I see lots of pink and red. All right, so today we are talking about Romans 8, 18 to 27. And um, we've spent many weeks now studying and wrestling with the theology of sin in Romans. And now we'll be turning a corner to a new topic, but lest you take a sigh of relief, we'll be diving into the theology of suffering. So both sin and suffering are, of course, a result of the curse, and both are what Jesus conquered when he died on the cross. We've learned how we are no longer slaves to sin, but did we realize that we no longer have to be slaves to suffering? that we can be freed from the way that suffering entangles us in discouragement and doubt. Jesus broke the curse of both sin and suffering for the not yet time in heaven, but also for the now time in our lives as we still struggle against the brokenness of this life. But how does this work? What does it look like? <clears throat> Last week, we saw how many times the word spirit was mentioned. As the chapter continues, the Holy Spirit will continue to be just as key to God's provision for dealing with our suffering as it is with our sin. Let's start with the verse at the end of last week's passage, verse 17 in Romans 8. We're going to back up a little bit. It says, and if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This seems to connect suffering and future glory. Heaven is not just a relief from suffering. It says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We know Jesus said to expect to suffer on this earth and even to expect persecution. But what does this mean? John Stott says in his commentary on Romans, the sufferings and the glory belong inseparably together. They did in the experience of Christ. They do also in the experience of people. It is only after we have suffered a little while that we will enter God's eternal glory in Christ to which he has called us. So the sufferings and the glory are welded. They cannot be broken apart. End quote. If God is completely good and loving, though, how could he have anything to do with suffering? He hates suffering. He hates disease and death and abusive relationships and war. We saw Jesus push back against these things every chance he got when he was on earth. It seems though in all of God's wisdom and power, he's decided not just to break the curse of sin and suffering, but while we wait to actually, as Johnny Erickson Tata says, use the things he hates to accomplish the things that he loves. He's taken, for example, the incredible injustice and evil of Russia's war in Ukraine and brought unity to a divided country. He's taught Ukrainians what it looks like and feels like to lay down your life for others or have someone do that for you. He's brought a generation of self-centered young people out onto the streets looking for ways to serve and help others. All of Europe, in fact, had to drop their inward-focused fears of the pandemic to take in refugees and give generously. Another example, more people are praying in Ukraine and for Ukraine than probably ever in the history of its existence. Are these not good things of a good God in the midst of great suffering? Yes, suffering is not of God, but it is also not beyond his reach or separate from him. He walks in its midst. 
powerful and good. For those who walk in the dark valleys still and still can't see him, hang in there. There's more in this passage. Verse 17 also says, provided we suffer with Christ. I remember when it first hit me that one of the ways that being like Jesus meant that we needed to suffer like he did. I had always thought of being like Jesus meant being loving and patient and good. Why must we be like him in that way? It may be part of the mystery of this glory that will somehow be revealed in us. Maybe it will somehow make the glory brighter and more amazing. The depths to which Jesus suffered certainly heighten his glory. In any case, verse 18 says the sufferings of this life cannot even be compared with the glory that is to come. They must instead be contrasted with the worst afflictions of life being called light and momentary and the eternal weight of glory tipping the scale, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4.17. And we must remember that this is actually the Apostle Paul talking. He's been kidnapped, which must have been terrifying. He's been beaten, which I'm sure was excruciating. Shipwrecked, unimaginable, arrested and imprisoned, discouraging to say the least. Yet he is convinced that all that is to come will be so amazingly good that the suffering of this life will be nothing in contrast. The glory of who God is will somehow more than compensate for all of our pain. It will satisfy our deepest needs and longings. It will be the answer to all of our questions. So what is this glory? Of course, our human languages are insufficient to describe it, but we get small glimpses of it in God's creation. Think, for example, of the incredible array of colors and designs just in flowers. Try to wrap your mind around the variety and beauty of wildlife. The incredible intricacies of the human brain and its range of emotions. Think on any one of these things for just a few minutes and you will have a glimpse of what glory is. But it's so much more than that. It's the purity of God's goodness without any darkness. It's a love so pure and overwhelming that it will fill every crack in our aching souls. Somehow this glory will be revealed to us, but also in us. God wants to share his glory with us forever. Pastor Tim Keller, who recently died of cancer, wrote in his book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. He said, just before my cancer surgery, I was wheeled into a room to be prepped. And in the moments before they gave me the anesthetic, I prayed. To my surprise, I got a sudden, clear new perspective on everything. It seemed to me that the universe was an enormous realm of joy, mirth, and high beauty. And within, within this great globe of glory was only one little speck of darkness, our world, and where, where there was temporary pain and suffering. But it was only one speck. And soon that speck would fade away and everything would be light. And I thought, it really doesn't matter how the surgery goes. Everything will be all right. Me, my wife, my children, my church will all be all right. I went to sleep with a bright peace on my heart. And now he sees all that in its fullness. A beautiful picture of how the glory will outweigh the suffering. Moving on in chapter eight, Paul talks about the effects of the curse on creation. Verse 19 says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in order that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So the fact that weeds grow in our garden, that disease spreads among trees, that flowers fade and die, that animals maim, that food rots and hurricanes kill, all these things are part of the curse brought on by the fall of Adam and Eve. And our impact as sinful humans on creation makes it worse with things like pollution and destruction of nature. Verse 22 says, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. 
The groaning of creation is not meaningless or a symptom of despair, though, according to Stott. If they're, be, if they're to be compared to the groans of childbirth, then they actually carry hope of future joy. I think that's the closest we can get to understanding the concept of present sufferings, not comparing to the joy that awaits us. It's a real thing for those of us who have experienced childbirth to quickly forget about or not care about the pain of labor once that beautiful new baby is in our arms. One of the many ways that God reminds us of the glory to come. The message translation of this passage describes it beautifully. All around us, we observe, observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The spirit of God is arousing us within. We are also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us. Any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us, but the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. So all of creation groans and longs to be set free from its bondage. And it seems that creation's liberation will occur along with our final transition to glory. They're connected. Therefore, creation waits eagerly for the revealing of our glory. The word the words waits eagerly in the Greek carry the meaning of craning the neck with great expectation, waiting to see. As incredibly beautiful as nature can be, we're not seeing it at its best. It will be made perfect as we will be. We have the four seasons to jump, demonstrate and remind us of that year after year. That new and beautiful life will come out of death, like in the spring. The prophet Isaiah wrote, of that time in 11.6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. There are many references to this in the New Testament as well. Jesus himself spoke of the new birth of the world at his coming in Matthew 19. Peter wrote of the restoration of all things in Acts 3. Paul wrote about this liberation here in Romans 8 and of reconciliation of all things in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1. John wrote in Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And it's also prophesied in Isaiah 35, 65, and 66. Stott writes, It would not be wise for us to speculate, let alone be dogmatic, about how the biblical and scientific accounts of reality correspond or harmonize, either in the present or in the future. The general promise of the renovation and transformation of nature is plain, including the eradication of all harmful elements and the replacement by righteousness, peace, harmony, and joy. But we should be cautious in pressing the details. The future glory is beyond our imagination. What we do know is that God's material creation will be redeemed and glorified because God's children will be redeemed and glorified. End quote. That brings us to verse 23. So not only creation, but we as God's children also do a lot of groaning and longing. The longing we feel is proof that we were created for something better, for the Garden of Eden, where all of this sin and brokenness did not exist. We feel the effects of decay as we get older. Our bodies don't work the way they did. There is pain and loss and death. Marriage is hard work. We toil for our food and clean laundry and dishes, and then we have to do it all over again tomorrow. Our good efforts and work and parenting don't always produce the fruit that we pray for. Unjust wars seem never ending. Lies on the internet are believed. Children are abused and kidnapped, and the list goes on and on. The groans are real and achingly deep. But is groaning the same as complaining or worrying or not having hope? Is it offensive to God? It depends on where your groans are directed. The Psalms show us that lament directed towards God is healthy and even helpful. The act of looking toward God 
with your aching is an act of faith. He wants us to bring him our pain and complaints. He wants to help us carry that burden. In fact, God has given us the Holy Spirit for that very purpose. Look at verse 23 again. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The phrase, the first fruits of the spirit is like the beginning of the harvest or the down payment on a house. When we become a believer, it says in Ephesians 1, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We have the Holy Spirit, but we have not yet acquired the fullness of all that the Spirit entails. Imagine that. And that Holy Spirit is meant to remind us of the guarantee of all that is to come. Last week, Maureen talked about our adoption as children of God, but this reference to a deposit of the Holy Spirit and waiting for our adoption reminds me of a story from my own life. In 2007, we had chosen we had chosen our son Zachary from a tall pile of files of Ukrainian orphans, a very surreal and difficult task to say the least. We had traveled to Kharkov, Ukraine and met him and signed the papers to go forward with the, with the adoption. Finally, on December 27th, we had our court case and the judge officially declared him ours. He was an ID. We were given a new birth certificate with his name, changed to our family name. So we went back to the orphanage and told him that he was officially a member of our family. But at one and a half years old, it was hard for him to understand what this meant. Um, But during that time, um, so, Um, Because of paperwork and red tape and corruption, we had to wait two more weeks before we could bring him home, even though he was ours. During that time, we visited him as much as we could in the orphanage, and we tried to show him what it was like being part of a family and what it was like to be well provided for by bringing him food and new toys and warm clothes. We did our best to give him all the attention and love that he had lacked. But those last weeks in the orphanage could not compare to the lifetime of what it would mean to be part of our family, to live in our home, to have parents every day, all day, and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents who would love him and hold him and lavish him with gifts, who would comfort him and care for him and teach him about the world around him. Not to compare our home to heaven, (laughs) but you get the analogy. He was in the family, but he was not yet home. It was just a deposit. Months later, we were visiting our family in London, and I remember standing there holding Zachary at a museum. I was looking at the crown jewels of the royal family and thinking he never could have fathomed life outside of the orphanage. How could we have possibly explained to him the weight of all the love and all the good ahead? He got enough of a taste of it in those two weeks, though, that he clung to us when we would visit in the orphanage and when we were finally able to carry him out the door. The passage now turns to the topic of hope. And this was a hard one for me. Hope is hard. Verse 24 says, for in this hope we were saved, referring back to our adoption and redemption of verse 23, in this hope. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Webster defines hope as desire accompanied by expectation or of belief in fulfillment. So it's more than just a desire or a wish. It involves expectation. Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We are called to have the kind of hope that is based on things invisible. Sometimes we feel like God is nowhere to be found or is not answering our prayers. 
It is in the crux of those moments that we are called to still have hope. The essence of faith is that it's blind. That's how it's defined. We cannot see God. We often cannot see his hand at work and we cannot see what is to come, but we are called to still trust that he is working and in control. We are called to still pray in faith and we are called to not be discouraged. It is not easy. It's a big ask. It says hope that is seen is not hope. We tend to want to rest our hope on things that we can see like medical treatments. But we have to be careful what we're resting our hope on. If we're praying, for example, for change in the life of a loved one, we're not putting our hope in seeing them changed. Our hope must rest elsewhere on something more solid. <clears throat> because God may not answer prayer in the way that we are expecting and asking. So what do we rest our hope on? Obviously, the answer is on God. But what does that actually look like? How do we do this? How can this passage help? Skipping down to verse 27 for a minute, it says, And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This shows us that God the Father is involved. He searches our hearts and knows what we need. He sees us. He has compassion. And he dispatches the Holy Spirit. We can rest our hope on the Father searching us and seeing us. How wonderfully reassuring it is to know that our hearts are seen and understood. Our hope can also rest on the second member of the Trinity. Jesus is not only humbled, he not only humbled himself to become human and suffer so that he could have empathy and know what it's like for us but he chose to suffer and die for us in order to break the curse that enslaved us. Many times in the depths of my suffering, I've accused God of not acting, especially when it came to the death of my two stillborn babies. One time when I was ranting to Paul Koyster, the director of our mission, about how God could have intervened and he could have prevented deep anguish and suffering, but he didn't. Dr. Koistra stopped me and said, Tracy, God did intervene 2,000 years ago on the cross. It knocked me off my high horse and left me speechless. If we are ever doubting God's lack of action or love, we need only to look to the cross to be reminded of the extent that he went to for us. <clears throat> and lastly, our hope can rest on the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. It's no small thing that when Jesus left the earth, he gave us the Holy Spirit. He literally gave us a piece of himself, a piece of God the Father. And like we just talked about, the Holy Spirit is a deposit. John 16, 7 says, it is to your advantage, Jesus said this, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Verse 26 in Romans 8 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. We are weak when it comes to praying, and we are weak even when it comes to depending on and hoping in the Lord. But the Holy Spirit helps us even with this. We don't have the mind of God. We're limited in what we can understand with our human minds, and so we don't really know what we should pray. And the Holy Spirit interprets our groans and turns them into prayers according to the will of God. Sometimes in our sufferings, we cannot pray whether it's because of anger, pain, disbelief, weariness, or shame, we have no words for God. Sometimes when I have been in this place, my family or friends sat by me and spoke words to God on my behalf. For a moment, they helped bear the weight of my burden. They searched around in my heart and imagined what I felt and what I wanted to ask, and they conveyed it to God. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit's job description. 
the spirit sees where we are at and translates to the father via groans that words cannot express. Imagine the richness of the Holy Spirit's groans compared to ours. Groaning involves letting this, the pain hit and grieving it, but then lifting it to a powerful and good God. The Holy Spirit does this for us. Imagine how moved the Father must be when he hears this. Our compassionate Father decreed that it should be like this, as it says in the verse, in accordance with God's will. How incredibly loving is this? So not only does creation groan and we groan, but we have a God that groans for us and with us. He identifies with the things that we hate about this broken world, and he shares in a longing for all things to be made right. So how do we wait? How do we not become a slave to our suffering? This passage tells us that we should wait eagerly because it's going to be good, so very, very good. We should wait patiently, trusting that he is at work, even though we can't see it. And we should wait with hope, resting on the fact that God is with us. He sees our pain. He did intervene to conquer sin and suffering 2,000 years ago. And that he still intervenes even now for us. And when it's a struggle to even have patience, faith, and hope, we have to go back to the gospel and repent and believe and repent and believe even in this and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a good and loving father and that you see us in our struggles and you understand and you intervene you intervened 2,000 years ago, and you intervene now for us. We thank you for your groans. Lord, I cry out to you for the suffering of these people, of this church in our lives. Lord, please help us to trust you. Help us to hold on to you and um, to have faith, even though we can't see. Lord, we thank you for your beautiful plan for us. We thank you for your beautiful love for us and for all the ways that you remind us of that. In Jesus' name, amen.